Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne, County Administrator and co-host of this program with Chairman Tom Wagner. And as you know, every month we strive to focus on a different department, generally have a different department head to share their roles and responsibilities. And today, I'm very pleased that our District Attorney, Joe DeCheck, is with us. Welcome, Joe. Well, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Tom. Pleasure to be here. It's good to have you here. We were just talking a little bit prior to the program. It's been, a, I think, since 2010 since Joe's been on the program, and it's not a reflection of our feelings about Joe. <laughs> Frankly, he is one of the busiest department heads working for Sheboygan County. He's been with the county now for 27 years. September 5th, 1989 was my first day as a prosecutor in Sheboygan County. And it's been how many years as the elected? I took, uh, I took office as the district attorney in 2003, January in 2003. 2003. So it'll be 14 years by the time I retire. And your last day working here will be January 2nd, 2017. At, at midnight. At midnight. Which I won't be staying there. We're going to get every bit of value we can out of here. <laughs> We've gotten such value from you and your team, Joe. It's just been a pleasure working with you for the last 18 years in my role as county administrator. And it's just good to have you on the program today. And it's a bit of a a fond farewell or reflection program where we're going to learn a little bit more about Joe and his roles and responsibilities, the good work that his office does, and and uh, give him a chance to look back a little bit as well as look forward. So let's start with setting the stage. We clearly are going to have viewers out there that haven't met you before. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and when you first started as a prosecutor. Well, I'm originally from New England, as you may tell from my slight accent. Um, and um, I was uh, a, what was then a paramedic, although it was before that certification level was created, we would call a mobile intensive care specialist, or mix for short. And I worked in a hospital and a rescue squad. And in my capacity of that, I was actually subpoenaed in for a court case uh, and went to the courthouse. And um, uh, I was going to testify, but since I was working that day, I had my scrub whites on with my stethoscope. And apparently the defendant saw me talk to his attorney and they accepted whatever offer there was. I never got to testify. But that just fascinated me. It really fascinated me. And I decided that I might like to do that. And so I applied to a number of law schools. Wisconsin accepted me. Uh, I had a couple others accept me. They are on the East Coast. And I figured, hey, if I'm going to do this, let me go somewhere I've never been before. And so I came to Wisconsin in 1985. I graduated in 1989, and I was 39 years old at the time, and then uh, September 5th of 1989, I was hired by then DA Jim Frisch in the Sheboygan County DA's office as an uh, assistant district attorney. So it's been 27 years, yeah. So prior to that experience, you were heading down kind of the med medical career path. Well, I was pretty much at the top of, of the pay scale. I've been doing it for 13 years, so that's pretty much at the top of pay scale. And um, quite frankly, I was... Um, just looking for some other interest. And, for a change. Yeah. And you go to the courtroom, and that sparked you going back to school, going to law school. Right. I, wow. Um, yeah, it was wow. just one of those coincidences where I think I'll I just try it. I'll, I'll, I'll take the law school admission test. I'll apply to school, see if they bite. They did. Uh, I decided to go to Wisconsin, and off I came. Yeah, yeah. And so you graduate from UW-Madison with your law degree and then came right back to Sheboygan County? Well, I wasn't. I was in Madison for, for the law school tenure. Right. And I went around, you know, after I graduated, I went all over the state trying to get a prosecutor's job. That was only, I only wanted to do criminal law and I didn't want to defend anyone. I wanted to prosecute them. And um, I think I had like 200 bucks in the bank left, 200 bucks to my name when Jim Frisch hired me. And I was like, oh, thank God. Uh, I'll be darned. And the other thing that prompted me was I learned in law school that if you um, graduate from a Wisconsin, from Wisconsin law school, and you're going to practice in Wisconsin, you don't have to stay, take a state bar exam. And I had been pretty much had it with exams. I mean, yes. I was an older student, you know. Right, right. I was surrounded by like kids, yeah. and I just had it with the exams. And so I decided to stay, and I was fortunate to find a job. Uh, in Sheboygan County. So you're hired as a prosecutor. You worked as a prosecutor for a number of years and then at some point made the decision to run as the elected department head, the district attorney. I did, yep. And I made a decision in 2002. I won the election in that November that year because they co coincide with the presidential elections. And I took office in 2003 and um, I've been there ever since. And have you had any competition ever since? Only for the first election. For the first election? The very first one, but after that, no. 
I'll be darn. And tell, us, tell me a little bit about your staff. Uh, how large is your staff? And I know you have kind of a unique mix. You're, you're a unique department in that you have both state prosecutors and county support staff working with you. Share with our viewers a little bit about that relationship, how that works. Well, we have uh, 7.5 full-time prosecutors, including myself. They're all state employees. Their benefits and salary are paid for by the state. We then have a county staff of 14 in our office. They're all obviously paid by the county. So in effect, we have two budgets. Every time budget time comes around, we have a state budget and we have the county budget. And uh, the county provides for not only the salary and benefits of everyone that works in our office, but the operating costs and things of that nature. The state only pays salary and benefits. And so, uh, and pretty much the state just tells us what's going to happen. Whereas in the county, we have some leeway to adjust our own budget and to make decisions based on what's best for the office, what's best for the county. Yeah, I imagine it's quite a difference from the state because here, as we both well know, we sit down, we talk it through. What are your needs? Uh, what are new initiatives? What's happening? And of course, for every department, that's different. And ultimately, the county board will decide. Mm -hmm. And at the state level, I can't imagine you have a lot of input or those kinds of well, discussions. There's absolutely no input whatsoever. They just tell you. Yeah. Um, even for uh, salary and things of that nature, they just tell you. So we never have we never have the opportunity to negotiate. Um, uh, not to the degree we negotiate with the county sure. and try and figure things out. Sure. So as you think back, as your years as a prosecutor and as the district attorney, what have been some of your more memorable cases? Well, you know, it's funny because the the serious ones are the most recent stick in your mind. That's just you know the way your memory works. And certainly the two 13-year-olds that um, committed the homicide against the great-grandmother of one of them, that sticks out. The, um, we have a current case pending where a young woman is alleged to have uh, strangled or suffocated, rather, her toddler child. I mean, we've had a number of homicides. We don't have a lot of homicides. That is straight, you know, someone wanting to kill someone in Sheboygan County, but we've had a few. We had uh, a drug dealers come up from uh, Milwaukee to erase the competition. And there's been homicides there. We've had, uh, you know, multiple day trials on those. And we have a lot of heroin cases. And I'm talking about not just delivery of heroin, but people who deliver it and then someone dies from it. And that's uh, under Wisconsin law, that's first degree reckless homicides, a serious, a serious offense. And that has just blossomed in the last eight, nine years. And then we have some odd stuff. I mean, we had, uh, I mean, people remember, I think his name was Jiffy. It was a, a dog that was just huge. It was obese. It was just a huge dog. And it was in the winter. It apparently got wet. Yeah, it laid down on a sidewalk, and it froze to the sidewalk. Yeah. Uh, the owner couldn't get it off. They called police. Police called uh, the um, uh, Schwein County Humane Society. They came out, had some warm water to get it off there, actually took custody of it and uh, get it down to its proper weight. I think it was even featured in one of the 4th of July parades, I, remember, I think, at yeah, some point. I remember that story. Um, and there was a misdemeanor charge against the woman because the dog was just in terrible shape. And Anyway, so, um, and I believe he was adopted by, some, you know, someone else adopted him, he's doing fine. But we've had some strange cases like that, yeah. you know. Yeah. Any case in particular that that is the most memorable or that, haunts you a little bit or s disturbs you to this day or has there just been so much on your plate at this point there's nothing you haven't seen well there's nothing we haven't seen I'm, you know i always think maybe this will surprise me but it doesn't yeah i think the two 13 year olds uh, and the uh, grandmother were very disturbing yes. i think uh, there was one young woman who gave birth at a workplace and killed her newborn infant uh, there was a trial on that uh, these things kind of stick with you um, yeah. And I do the child pornography charges, too. I have since I was an assistant district attorney. One thing I will not miss as of January 2nd, and that's just really, it's just tough to do that because we have to view the videos or view the photographs, and these are little kids being sexually assaulted and, being, and it's being distributed. You know, it's just, so yeah, those things I won't miss at all. Um, but yeah, it's all very disturbing. We know going into this field, it's going to be disturbing. We know that. Right, um, but right. still, it's... I was talking to someone from the office, someone's been there a long time, and she was telling me that the other day a man in Pig or Pick and Save, wherever it was, came up to her and said, that's a very nice dress you're wearing, and walked away. We get really suspicious and paranoid from what we do, and she said to me, I kept my eye on that guy, I wasn't sure what he was up to. You know, there are some people that just are nice people and say, hey, you're looking pretty good, and don't want anything else. Right. And yet our view is that 
what the heck's that guy up to? Mm -hmm. And it's the same with going, you know, just walking down the street, you see someone standing by you, and you're like, I keep an eye on this guy. That's from the nature of the job, and it gives you a skewed view of society right. because all we see are the criminals. Yeah. We don't see, for the most we see victims, but we don't see, for the most part, you know, the, the, the many, the vast majority of people that are good citizens, they do the job, they pay their taxes, you know, they support their schools, they have great kids. We don't see those people. Right. No, we think about law enforcement and how they so often are dealing with people that are making bad choices and, and the, the law enforcement officers can get jaded. And in our 18 years of, of working together or interacting, you know, I've no, never once asked you, how do you and your staff manage that kind of emotional, disturbing conduct, behavior, information? I, you know, I, I'm sure our viewers can share with I can feel, you know, at, in our own homes things happen, or in our families things happen, or we may know someone where something bad has happened, but when, and we know how emotionally trying that is on all of us, yet when you're dealing with it every single day and at the level that you are, how do you, what do you, what do you do to stay balanced? What do you and your staff do to stay grounded? The most important thing is you leave it at the office. You don't bring it home. Um, it's a job you have to do, and it can get, get quite emotional, particularly during a trial when you're trying to secure a conviction right. of someone that's done something really nasty to someone. Uh, and then when, and we do win the vast majority of our trials, it's just the nature of things. Um, and when you, when you get a guilty verdict, um, it's very satisfying, but then it's time to go on to the next thing. Uh, so you really don't have time to yeah. reflect at any length on the emotions you may have during a particular trial. I think uh, children as victims is the most emotional for any for all of us, mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, there's a lot of those uh, around uh, in the county. Uh, but you have to put it aside, you know, and you have to uh, divorce yourself from what you have to do, what you see, what you experience, because you have to do it at your job from your everyday life. Right. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing the work that you and your staff do. Last question. I'll turn it over to Tom. Have there been any programs that you've created or initiated that have helped with this challenging workload? Well, uh, we do have some diversion programs in effect. Uh, the first one was created by my predecessor, it was the check fraud unit, and then when I came on, uh, we had to find a way to raise revenue, and so um, we had a county ordinance which created this check diversion program. You know, it's a, it's a misdemeanor, depending on the, the, the um, amount of the check, but it's a misdemeanor issue, or a check that bounces. So what we try to do with this program is give the people a chance to pay whoever it is, most of the time it's a merchant, back. They pay a fee of $35 or 20% of the total amount of the checks, whatever it's higher. And then we give them about you know, nine months to a year to pay back that merchant. Merchants really like this. I mean, uh, you know, we don't charge them a fee for this. Mm -hmm. And it brings in some revenue into the, into the county. It's not a lot, but it brings in some. Um, we also have uh, Judge Sakevich, Angela Sakevich, began a veterans court about two years ago, and we participate, participate in that. We have a prosecutor that's on the veterans court, uh, and that's aimed at getting um, veterans of our military um, the assistance and the um, counseling they may need because of their experiences uh, in a relatively um, intensive treatment program, while at the same time, uh, allowing them the opportunity to not be convicted of crime because if it's a serious crime, that's not an option. And then we just began our uh, alcohol and drug treatment court, which was two years in the making, and that's for high-risk, um, uh, high-need uh, persons who are addicted. Uh, we started it about two years ago because of the heroin influx and opiate influx, and it's gradually expanded to include alcohol, which is, everybody knows is a drug. Um, and we're just now beginning with that. I think we have six or eight people in the program already. Mm -hmm. um, and it's another way to provide high supervision, uh, high, um, high amounts of, of counseling to these people, uh, rather than, than just sending them to jail or prison. Right. Um, so, you know, we're trying to decrease the cost and expense of jail and particularly prison. And uh, we think these programs will assist in doing that decrease cost as well as really give people the support they need to 
break out of those. Yeah, they got to break out of them. But they'll do it the rest of their lives. They're always an addict, just like an alcoholic's always an alcoholic. Whether they're a heroin addict or opening addict, they're always going to be an addict. The quest, the key is, uh, give them the tools to get out of that. Uh, they're always going to be an addict, but to give them the tools to understand why they're addicted to it, look at the problems that may have caused the addiction, uh, and get them into a position where they can make the good decisions for themselves, right. and then hopefully become produ productive citizens. Excellent. Thank you, Joe. Tom. Thank you, Adam. Joe, it's been a pleasure working with you in the last uh, uh, eight yeah, years. You were really the long term I know Tom for a long time. That's right. Know? Eight years ago when I first got on the county board, yeah. my first assignment uh, from then, uh, Chairman Vandersteen was on the law committee where I first met you, really, and uh, worked with you. And it was a pleasure working with you then. Well, it's thank been you. a pleasure working with you Thanks so much. all through the time. So. Congratulations on your retirement. Um, you oversee one of the 19 departments, as Adam had, had talked about, but yours is unique because it's um, part state, your state employees, as you mm -hmm. talked about, the district attorneys are, and uh, but the county employees are there too. How does that work within the, the office setting when you have uh, kind of multiple employers with the different employee groups? Well, even though we have multiple employers, you know, I'm the guy that everyone comes to. You know, any any DA, you know, in the state, it doesn't matter who their employer is, the state or the county. You know, they go to the DA or they have problems and stuff. I like the thing. We had a lot of people that have been there a long time, and we have a very good. Uh, even though we're just inundated with work, we have a very good morale in our office. We uh, encourage people to if something's bothering. Let's talk about it. Let's not let it fester. Uh, let's, you know, if they have suggestions that make things better, we'll be happy to, to listen to them. And if they're good suggestions, implement them. And I just, I'm particularly proud of, of the level of morale we have in the office uh, between the, not only the prosecutors but uh, and the staff, but among everybody. I, I just I, I just like to think I had something to do with, with um, them staying so long uh, and, um, and being content in their jobs and doing their jobs well. I'm sure it does. Um, how many assistant DAs do you have, and what is your total budget? Uh, we have 7.5 uh, prosecutors by the latest um, Legislative Auto Bureau uh, analysis uh, procedure, which is a bipartisan independent uh, 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 entity that advises the legislature. Um, we are four and changed prosecutors shy of what we should have to handle our caseload. Um, the need for, for uh, prosecutors has gone up since the, the previous evaluation. It was at 117, and now it's at about 140. Um, and we really haven't gotten any relief from the state. And unfortunately, I mean, in 1990, we all, before I, when I was hired, I was a county assistant district attorney. In 1990, the state took it over. We're going to pay for this. We're going to, you know, we'll take care of that. And just to be honest, you know, they just dropped the ball ever since. And um, I think the last time we even got a half position, that's the half of the 7.5, was in 2002, if I'm not mistaken. And every year I've asked for more people, and I don't think anyone in the state's gotten it, with the exception of the Public Defender's Office, that over the last two budgets had 63 positions added, and we had three, which were simply making half-time, three-quarter time into full-time. Uh, so, it, you know, it's not us versus them thing, but we need help, too. Uh, so that, that's that's one of the significant problems we have. We still have the same amount of work to do. Um, that is, you know, it keeps getting, it keeps increasing. Our budget's just under a million dollars a year, and that budget would be the, just the county budget. Uh, the state budget, they just tell us what it is. That's it. But the county budget's just under, just on shy of a million dollars a year. Right. And I know you, uh, your relationship. If you want to take a, here's your chance. Uh, uh, relationship with the county board over the years and uh, with the state attorney general's office because you have to have two relationships I right assume. and you know the county board's been great I mean they're being you know we don't agree on every single thing and we've you know I've had some you know, moments of um, not conflict but difference of opinion sure. but you know what you do is you sit down you work it out um, and you don't let that color the rest of your relationship with anybody else and I think county board and I the law committee members, particularly because they're my main contact, um, we've always been able to work things out. They, you know, people listen to what your problem is. You know, they'll listen to what solution you have to offer, and they'll make a decision. Because you know, the county board is essentially the fiscal watchdog for the county, and uh, anything involving money or more money or increase in tax levy, right. they take a very close look at that. And there's going to be a compelling reason, I think, 
for anyone to be successful or to find alternatives to that. And I, I think over the years, um, we've been able to do that. With, with uh, I know there's county board members I've dealt with in the past are not there anymore. Uh, there are new ones now uh, that I'm just dying to deal with, particularly on the law committee. There's uh, a couple of new people on the law committee. Um, but as long as we can always sit down and talk about it and just not shut off the conversation, uh, it'll work out. And I think that's what has happened over the years. I really appreciate the county board uh, being willing to listen to the unique problems we have in our office and to uh, listen to our proposed solutions and to offer counter solutions or alternative solutions. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. I think the key there is that there's back and forth and discussion right. before decisions are made. Yeah, you get ticked off with someone and say, I'm not talking to that guy again. No. What does that accomplish, you know? Not much, right? Yeah, it doesn't accomplish no. anything. No. You're going to be, uh, as, you, as you retire, you will. there will be a replacement, a new uh, a DA will come in, and he's in your office right now. He is. And he's assuming because of the fact that he's running unopposed. Any thoughts uh, going forward for the, the new uh, DA that you want to? Well, I, I think the DA is obviously in good hands. Uh, uh, ADA Joel Ermansky, um, uh is the only one on the ballot. Mm -hmm. So as long as he beats out like Mickey Mouse on Down the Rock, <laughs> he'll be fine. And he's been there 10 years, about 10 years. Um, you know, I hired him uh, out of Marquette Law School. He had a lot of experience with the Milwaukee DA's office uh, gun team. They'll have teams down there. We don't have mm -hmm. teams. We don't have enough people. And Joel, um, I, I'm very confident that the DA's office will be in just great hands with Joel. I really do. I see. One thing I was afraid of, I didn't want someone coming in from the outside and decide, oh, I'm going to revamp everything. Mm -hmm. We really have come to the point where our organization is out of necessity, not out of choice. And for someone to come in, someone going to do a thing all oh, this different here, it's just not going to work because we tried them all. It just doesn't work. Joel knows the problems in our office. He knows um, mm -hmm. uh, what we face every day, uh, and he's a good communicator. He's an excellent prosecutor. So I'm very confident that the Sheboygan County DS office will be in good hands. Mm -hmm. Very nice of you to say. Um, what are your to end with my question is, you're, and you talked about a little bit earlier, uh, your concerns about crime in Sheboygan County going forward. What are your biggest concerns relative to that? And well, you know, we had just an explosion of uh, heroin opiate use yeah. in the county. Um, it's not just this guy, it's the whole state. Exactly. Uh, but um, in fact, you know, uh, we have, you know, we do after hours warrants for the police. You know, crime doesn't end at five o'clock right. Monday through Friday. So we're, uh, I'm available if police need an immediate search warrant to help them get it. Uh, to contact a judge to take their testimony, whatever. And we have, th to make it faster and easier, we have these templates for drugs where all the drugs are listed. Well, prior to about eight years ago, heroin wasn't even on that list because we had so few heroin cases. Now, it's heroin opiates and the most types of cases we have. So there's just, and, and we had the, you know, we had the first um, prosecution of someone who supplied heroin uh, to, um, a person that died in Sheboygan County about eight years ago. And that was the first time that ever had been charged in the county. I mean, we just didn't have this before. Although I, 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 I really like to say that even though people, you know, look at the drug problem and some of the other problems we have, Sheboygan County is still a very safe place to live. It's a very good place to raise your family. It's got great schools. It's got good community uh, cooperation. So even though there are, you know, an uptick in crime, particularly some of the serious crimes with drugs, I think that I still haven't lost my impression of Sheboygan as just one of the best places to raise your family, to have kids, to be safe. Yeah. Frankly, coming from the district attorney, that's saying a lot because you obviously see the, the side of life that is not so positive all the time. So that's very well said. Thank you, Joe. Oh, sure, Tom. Well, we only have a couple of minutes remaining, and you've covered a lot of ground, but... I wanted to go back to that reflection moment, 27 <laughs> years, yep. 27 years doing very challenging, important work in the community. You talked about some of the challenges, some of the memorable moments, some of the good improvements that have been made. Any regrets, Joe? Anything that you look back on and you wish you would have become a doctor instead of a district attorney? No, I actually uh, thought about that before I applied to law school and I would have to take so many I was a political science major, so I would have taken so many lab sciences, I couldn't do it. And then came the subpoena, and I said, oh, this is what I want to do. Yeah. No, I don't have any regrets. I mean, I miss the East Coast, like, ter just terribly. I miss fresh seafood and, and clams, you know, just terribly. And, um, 
And when I go home for my one vacation every year around Christmas and New Year's, um, I just stuff myself with clams and mussel and all sure. and everything. Sure. Uh, it's not that bad, though, because I can't see the other side of Lake Michigan, so it's kind of like the ocean. Right. Um, so I really have no regrets. Um, I never thought I'd be doing anything with 27 years because I'd been bouncing around. You know, I was uh, I was in the Peace Corps originally out of college. I was worked in a uh, in a uh, general dynamics uh, uh, inspecting nuclear submarine construction. I mean, and then I became a paramedic. I mean, I just didn't know what I was doing, yeah. and now I found what I really like to do. And uh, I will miss all the people terribly, but I got to be honest, I'm not going to miss this job at all. Um, 27 years, being a prosecutor is more than enough, and it's time for the younger guys to take over. Any foreshadow on what lies ahead for Joe DiCicco? Well, I'm going to stay in Sheboygan. I mean, I really like uh, Sheboygan County. I live in the town of Wilson. Um, I am going to teach more at uh, Lakeland uh -huh. Co University. Yep, Sorry, Lake, yep, Lakeland right. University. Terrific. Um, Part-time, and I enjoy that. I've done that for several years now. So, uh, And I'm going to travel more, but my home will be here. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for spending 30 minutes with us this afternoon. I hope you enjoyed listening and learning more about District Attorney Joe DiCecco. Every time I spend time with Joe, I learn something, and he has had a remarkable life, tremendous experience, and the value he has brought this community. I don't know if there's anyone, anyone who lives here that fully appreciates your role and responsibilities and what you and your outstanding team do. So thank you, Joe. And thank you for your kind remarks. Good to have you here. And thank you for joining us. Next month, we're going to continue some focus on the court system and that important responsibility. Our family court commissioner, Ryan O'Rourke, is going to be here. He's only been family court commissioner now for a little over a year. And uh, I'm sure you're going to enjoy hearing from him and learning more about the family court commissioner's responsibilities. But until then, thank you for joining us. And Joe, best wishes in retirement. Thanks thank so you much for joining guys. us.